Today, the British Chamber of Commerce in Denmark is pleased to welcome Patrick Holford to our discussion series. Patrick is no stranger to Denmark, having worked with Danish corporations, research institutions, SMEs and startups for over 20 years. He spent a couple of these years living in Denmark. He is Vice President of Digital Industries for Spinverse, which builds EU technology consortia. He is an advisor at a Nordic Space VC and a couple of startups. Patrick's experience in high-level management posts and Nordic leadership positions has equipped him to advise business leaders on how to maximize the opportunities that arise when business and technology merge. Whether this be in new areas of innovation or by using this convergence to create new business models. Patrick has spoken at and moderated many events in Denmark over the years and has become a regular speaker at the British Chamber of Commerce in Denmark. He is a guest business columnist for the Copenhagen Post, where you can find his column Outside Innovation. And a published fiction author, his books include the Danish thriller Tilda and Lerke. I'm pleased to welcome Patrick for a wide-ranging business and technology discussion. So let's now dive in. Always good to catch up. So I uh, work for a Finnish company called Spinverse, and we're building these large EU-funded consortia. Um, the division I run is focused around digital industries, so health technologies, electronics, computing, robotics, smart cities and mobility. So we bring together consortia from all across Europe, from uh, startups, from SMEs, corporations. We bring universities and research teams together to drive certain projects to basically accelerate research into uh, industry. And you've told me so many great stories about the things you've been doing. Uh, have you got some good examples that you're allowed to share with the world that, of what, what sort of things come out of these consortia? Yeah, sure. We're working on a really interesting one that got funded a couple of years ago. It's called Energy ECS, and you can actually, there's a website for it. It's mm. funded by the European um, EU, and it's all about uh, combining electronics and transportation or mobility with energy systems. And one of the big use cases we have in it is actually uh, being developed in Iceland where we're going to be trying to land drones on buses in the city of Reykjavik so that the drones can hop on and hop off of different buses as the buses navigate their routes both in the city and outside in the country. Mm -hmm. The drones can recharge and then what they can do is they can take off and fly different missions, whether it's for city inspections or the police or the Coast Guard or uh, other commercial organizations to do inspections. So the trick is really it's partly it's technical. How do you get a drone to sync up with a bus and recharge and do it safely and securely? But then the other challenge is around um, kind of ma matching the drones up with the missions Mm -hmm. A bit like uh, you know Uber, for example, but a slightly more complicated in in some ways. So we're building this pilot up in Iceland, and you know hopefully in a, in a year or two we're also going to be able to demonstrate it. And um, the idea is that uh, we can expand it mm -hmm. as well. So this is an example of the consortiums that we're building. And to do that, you need to bring many different types of organisations together. Britain's out of this at the moment, um, but there are negotiations going on, I understand, and the, there has been uh, an attempt to, to, to get Britain post-Brexit back into some of these, uh, these arrangements, particularly in the area of science and technology. Um, it's, we're, we're missing out on, on, on something here, but I, uh, there is money also in, in the UK that's working on other projects. I don't know if these are competing projects or there is still some dialogue going on in the scientific and technical environment, even though the politicians are, are having some uh, interesting discussions along the way. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a big shame because there was so much um, scientific um, capabilities and also industrial insights that were a big part of the previous Horizon 2020 program. And, mm. and of course, now we're into, well into Horizon Europe. Um, and uh, the UK organizations, institutions were such, were embedded in so many consortium projects. But now, um, of course, that's disappeared. So um, a big part of what we do is, is working with the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, we work with Southern, Eastern, Central Europe, the Nordic countries, 
Um, and um, there's obviously a lot more opportunity for those organizations, although the pot of money is, mm. is lower. But um, one of the interesting things I've been noticing is the, how proactive the Scottish government is in the Nordic region. Yes. So, yes. you know, every week there's delegations from Scotland, different, uh, whether it's energy or health technologies. Last week I was at Slush and I was on a panel on um, one of the side events on stage with some venture capital companies. Mm -hmm. um, we were hosting uh, a cohort of, cohort of startups from Startup Grind Scotland, okay. together with Scottish government, because I'm, I'm part of this Global Scott organization. Mm. So I'm kind of like a trying to help them out, get connected to different initiatives in, in Finland and the greater Nordic region as well. Mm. And that's obviously how I, I work with you and uh, Simon in the, um, the, the team as well in Denmark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a new, stronger team now in Denmark mm. that's looking out, based in Denmark, looking after the Nordics, that's trying to uh, facilitate the dialogue that's going on. Yeah, but I think the, the Scots in general, they are being extremely proactive about this and uh, you know, reaching out to the different energy infrastructure organizations, health tech, startup ecosystems, venture funding. And it's about showcasing their capabilities and for export, but also about attracting innovation, ideation, um, all kinds of um, maybe venture opportunities for investing in, in mm. Scotland as well. I mean, building on their capabilities around engineering or uh, energy technologies. Mm. Scotland is potential to be one giant battery with all the waves and the winds yes. that they have there, of course, and um, financial um, expertise as well. Mm. So for us in the Nordics, looking at Scotland, it's a very, very big opportunity. Yes, and uh, I mean, I've been getting a lot of requests now from um, Chambers of Commerce in Scotland. They're looking to, to come to the Nordics, looking to come to Denmark and work together with companies here, uh, mm -hmm. looking to, to set up meetings, doing a inward missions, etc. And I've noticed that's changed. It's, it's accelerated recently. Yeah. So it, I think it fits together with what you're, you're saying about uh, what's, what's going on in your group. Yeah. One of the other areas I forgot to mention is in space technology, actually, because um, mm -hmm. Scotland's pretty advanced in, I mean, they're building their own um, launch sites, and, uh, but they've got really high quality engineering capabilities. Um, and in Nordics, we have a big focus on space technology, both upstream, getting the, the rockets and the satellites up there and navigating themselves, but also making use of the downstream data. So we see a big opportunity for collaboration with Scotland on that. And actually, I'm an advisor at a, a new Nordic space fund out of Sweden. Okay. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is also trying to make connections across the northern region. If you forget about the whether it's EU or whether it's you know the UK, we're we're talking about kind of geographic stretches of opportunity yeah. here. Yeah. Um, so right across that belt from uh, Iceland, Scotland, uh, into the Nordic countries, there's a huge opportunity for collaboration in space technology. I mean, I, I I'm representing loads of different businesses in Denmark in different sectors. We're interested to see we're interested to see where. The new te technological developments can take us where they can add some extra value, where we can use the skills available in, in, in Denmark and in, in the rest of the, the, the Nordics and Scandinavia. But wh where do you see the big opportunities? Well, that's a broad question, but uh, I would say that one of, the, uh, one of the biggest areas at the moment is around energy security, um, uh, ensuring that uh, we maintain our, the integrity of our energy uh, supplies, the distribution, you know, how it's kind of uh, stored and captured. Um, and, you know, in the longer term, continue on our pace of um, transitioning into more uh, sustainable energy solutions. So there's a lot of work in terms of protecting the existing infrastructure, both physically and from cyber mm. attacks, um, managing the load, of course, we're coming into the, the winter. Uh, but at the same time, ensuring that we don't take our eyes off the ball in terms of um, deploying our new green capabilities so that we can actually wean ourselves off of these dependencies that mm. have constrained us right now. Mm. There's a lot of opportunity there in terms of uh, innovation from different types of organizations, whether they're uh, startups or SMEs, research institutions and corporates, um, and also 
I would say part of that is bringing back a lot of the manufacturing and the design development into Europe, making us more self-sufficient and less dependent on brittle supply chains. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been exposed there, obviously, with the not just the pandemic, but the Suez traffic jams and other things, geopolitical issues and the war. So making Europe as strong and sustainable. And, and when I say making Europe, I also include the UK in that because, you know, we're, we're, we're so tied at the hip in terms of many, many other initiatives and NATO and all of these other yeah. things. So, yeah. you know. And the UK is a, is a big customer of the, uh, the Danish wind energy market. So wind, and, yeah. you know, we've got a companies like Earthstill here that are, are now winning prizes for being the most environmentally friendly energy company in the world, etc. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the physical manufacturing or final assembly is now being done in the UK before it's sailed out into the, into the North Sea. But do we, do we have an issue with the, the, the electronic technology behind a lot of these things? A lot of production has moved out into the East. Does that give us any challenges into the future? Is that something that we should be bringing back? I think it's something that is already happening. I think if you look at some of the um, EU funding programs that are going on, um, there's a big focus on bringing back the electronics um, uh, uh, through CHIPS Act and um, various other initiatives. Uh, it's, it's of course not just electronics, it's also photonics, it's um, artificial intelligence, fusing all of mm. this together. It's robotics, it's... Um, uh, remote sensing with satellites, it's, it's bringing all of these capabilities mm. and also spreading, making use of the distributed talent that we have across Europe, from Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Central, uh, Nordic countries, and of course, working with the UK as well, mm. um, and our other partners in associated countries. And one of the other interesting areas is around um, situational awareness of what's going on in, mm. in such distributed infrastructures, whether it's the pipes under the sea or um, telecommunications, cables, connections, um, remote uh, energy um, locations, we have to be aware of what's going on so we can make use of digital twins and we can make use mm. of remote sensing robots to, to capture our um, real-time understanding of what's going on, not just in terms of the performance of the um, energy infrastructure, but the integrity, the safety and the security. And the, the resilience. The resilience, yeah. precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be a big, important area for, certainly for Denmark in, in, the, in the coming years, uh, and probably for the rest of the Nordics. Actually, I was looking at the Financial Times this morning, there was a good article about um, North Sea energy infrastructure and, and the connectivity indeed across all of Europe. Um, of the electricity and the gas supplies, mm. but I, there was a special focus on these new energy islands that I think are being constructed yes. but between, I think it's the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Danes, the British, um, and all of the kind of connections that are needed in order to secure the future. And also wave energy as well. I think um, the, the UK, Scotland especially, um, they've got a lot of great wave technology. Um, these energy generators that you can put just below the surface of the sea and they create a lot of a lot of power mm. uh, a lot of movement in those currents so it's really a question of how do you actually get what they're generating and ship get it, it get it on ship it to where it needs to be used and and then maybe also use it to um, develop green hydrogen at the location mm. and then use that so mm. but we see so much opportunity across Europe in terms of these new uh, capabilities for shifting to this um, green energy, but at the same time protecting the integrity of our existing energy infrastructure. Good. There's, there's plenty to talk about here, and there's lots of lots of technology uh, that's emerging, and we just need to be open-minded about how we we make use of that. But one of the uh, one of the things you're also working on is <coughs> is with venture capital. Um, I understand that you're. Um, you're also now in that part of the market, so help, helping companies get funding. Yeah, I'm an advisor at this new Swedish uh, or Nordic um, VC, Space VC, and they're focused on um, building a, a new fund at the moment. It's called Rim Capital, and they've actually just signed an agreement with a big French VC as well. Um, so we're looking at creating this very interesting venture firm, and I'm just an advisor 
Um, but then on the side, I'm also an advisor to a couple of uh, Nordic uh, startups. So one is a drone company that does inspections of electricity wires. Mm -hmm. And the other one is a Finnish company that is developing a augmented reality or heads up display for drone pilots. Okay. So, um, and we're doing a lot of testing and the demonstrations with the police and other security services at the moment. Um, and they're called Anarchy Labs. So the idea is that the, the drone pilot could wear a Microsoft HoloLens and they get all of the navigation, uh, insight, uh, beamed directly into their eyes. And they don't have to be able to see where the drone is. It could be behind a building and, you know, they can control it that way. And So they're seeing through the drone and, and yeah, flying can. it as though they're sitting in it. Exactly. They can get this first person view through the drone, but then they also have the navigation and other sensor data coming through. But because it's a Microsoft HoloLens, it's augmented, so it's not blocking your your view, you can see everything that's going on around you. So, so yeah, I'm an advisor there as well. I mean, have you got any thoughts on? Uh, we get lots of comments about being it being difficult to find venture funding in in Scandinavia, certainly in in Denmark, compared to the U.S., compared to the U.K. Uh, is that something you, you're seeing in, in real life, or is that just something people keep talking about? I think you, you hear these stories, then you hear these stories where they say, you know, you, these periods where they say it's easy to find money, then it's not easy. But really, the, the trick is to have this kind of um, symbiosis where you have a, an organization that has a really good story and a concept if they're early stage. Uh, or if they're a bit later, they might have a prototype. And it's really matching them, them up with the right venture capital company and the right people at that organization. And, and, and sometimes it's not just the money that the company needs. What they need is advice. They need advice, they need access, they need doors to be opened. They may need uh, mentoring and nurturing and you know all kinds of things other than just the, just the, the, the funding to give them a runway. So very often a lot of the VCs that I work with, um, they have brought incredible amount of expertise and insights to the company that allows them to actually remove some of the roadblocks, yeah. which are not just financial. Patrick, we, we see each other fairly regularly because you do spend a, a lot of time in Denmark and you have done over the last 20 years. Uh, do you have any observations about the way things are working in, in Denmark in tech? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, the, the thing I, I've always loved about working in Denmark is that it's very easy to do business. It's so easy to trade and um, obviously the language helps but um, more the attitude as well and so whether you're going into a university or a in research institution, startup, one of the big corporates, we have so many large corporations uh, headquartered, global corporations headquartered out of Denmark but it's, I just find it very easy and natural to um, to work with these different mm. types of organizations, whether you're on Zealand, on Foon, or on Uland, um, there's just this kind of trading approach. But mm. uh, underneath that, there's all of the technological innovation and the thought leadership as well. Mm. And of course, the proximity to the other Nordic countries, to Germany, uh, Central Europe, everything is, is kind of like this hub. And I think that that's one of the things why it's so easy to spin up new ideas mm do prototypes, um, test new business models here, for example. So, so D Danes are fairly open-minded to think, thinking about new ideas. Are there some core skills we have here as well? I think uh, one of them is probably direct feedback. So, you know, I've been on stage many times in Denmark um, and also done some teaching uh, with you also at CBS. And uh, one of the things you notice here is that people aren't shy about giving you their opinions on what you're talking about or what they're thinking about. And so you can actually, um, you can drive discussions forward pretty quickly here, I would mm. say. Um, and I think that that's one of the interesting things about working in Denmark. You've obviously developed a relationship with Denmark over these years, and it seems to have given you inspiration into, into what you're now doing, which is writing books as a sideline. It seems like, I'm amazed that you have the time, um, but how do you get into it? Well, I always wanted to write a novel. Uh, well, I thought about writing a business book, but business problem with business books in, is in, unless they're really innovative, they're pretty much out of date as soon as Before they've hit the... Published. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. So um, I write a lot of business blogs and I've you know, done this Copenhagen Post 
column. But I thought, okay, I'll have a crack at a, um, a, a novel. And I wanted to write a thriller set in Denmark. And I, I was actually flying back to Helsinki and I had this idea, okay, I know exactly how I'm going to do this. And I, I hammered away on the keyboard for about three months, um, really early in the morning, like 5.30 for an hour or so, and then at weekends. And I got this, this book uh, finished. I called it Tilda and Lerk. I probably didn't even pronounce that right. But um, the problem, the, it, writing the book was not a problem. The editing and all of the mm. understanding of this chicken and egg, do you get an agent or a publisher and how do you move it forward? Well, in the end, I decided to self-publish it on Amazon. But um, I learned a lot of things through that, that first book. Actually, I happen to have a copy of it here. So, yeah. But it's, um, once you've written your first book, I think it's, even if it doesn't sell, you've, you've written a book. You've written a book. Yeah. And then you get inspired to write the next one. Exactly. I, I've written another one now and set in Iceland, a techno thriller. So, yeah, that's out on Amazon as well. And is there any spin-off from writing a book to what you do in, in your working life? Is there any... Uh, I think it's more the other way around. So I, I put quite a bit of tech and thought um, into my books, or my two books. Um, and I think that I find it quite easily easy to write about technology and the implications of certain technologies in a kind of uh, in a thriller scenario. Because I've been in tech for, you know, 30, 35 years now. So I, that's, there's a lot of tech baked under it, but you can't just have a book on tech. You have to have the threads of the different characters and the situations. Mm. And, and so that's why I, um, I uh, focused on this Danish novel. I thought I could m write a half-decent book about some assassins running around Denmark, trying to take each other out. Uh, and the, the other book, that's even more tech-related. Yeah, I set that in Iceland in 2028. So that's all around, um, actually, renewable energy and um, food production and uh, what happens if... Um, organizations start to try and take down the whole system. So I wrote this kind of thriller about these um, five ladies who are, uh, they kind of arrive on Iceland and they've, they've got different um, reasons for being there and I tried to create a thriller around that. So, but underneath there's this kind of Icelandic techno theme. But I also set it out in the wilds as well of Iceland because I think one of the things, if you, you've been to Iceland, it's, it's spectacular and you can just create such a, well, hopefully you can, you can try and create some sense of the, the, the power of the place. And is, there, is there any technology in, in this story that is not quite there yet yes. in terms of the real world? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I probably pushed it a little bit. I, well, I've got these monowheel, autonomous monowheels flying around Reykjavik and I've got um, rail guns and all kinds of things that probably won't be ready in time. But I just... You know, I threw it in there. It's a novel. It's a sci-fi novel. And can we look forward to any new words? I mean, the metaverse was first mentioned in a Snow Crash for a long, long time ago. Um, anything like that? I, I ha I'm not sure if I've created any new buzzwords yet. But um, at the moment, I'm actually working on a sequel to Tilda and Lacker, and I'm trying to tie it up with the previous book and also connect it into this Icelandic book. So um, I'm hoping to get that out by the end of the year or drafted, but then I've got to go through this decision-making process of do I find a you know, Danish publisher, for example, or um, an agent, yeah. or do I go it alone again? And how do you get it serialized and made into a... A TV show, yeah, TV that would show. be nice, yeah. <laughs> Great, uh, that's, that's, that's fascinating, and it's probably not what we're normally talking about, but uh, fascinating to hear what you're doing there. Thanks so much for your time and I hope we've given some inspiration to the people that are watching this.